We all love the NBA, right? I mean, love the NBA. Love the a NBA. Day like this. Well, our next guest is going to join us here. According to legend, he loves the NBA so much that in 2020, he quit his job to cover the NBA. Get out of here. True. We'll find out. Uh, NBA capologist from Spot Track, Keith Smith with us. Keith, is that true, sir? Yeah, that's 100% true. I uh, was covering the NBA part-time at a 20-year career with Disney. Uh, and uh, <laughs> three weeks before the uh, Rudy Gobert shut the NBA season down, I left my 20-year career uh, to cover the NBA full-time. So it was, uh, yeah, my timing Perfect timing. timing Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow. But it's all worked out for you, hasn't it? Yeah, it's all worked out. I'm living the dream now. So it all ended up okay in the end. Wow. Yeah, we, we appreciate your time very much. Let's start with this. You know, Malik Monk now, the reports are that he has agreed he's going to resign when as soon as he can with the Kings. What then would the Kings have to do to retain the MLE? Because I believe they're just barely over uh, the threshold now. Yeah, so what this time, uh, once they resign Malik Monk, they're going to be about a million or so into the tax, which is not, not a big deal. That's, that's, you know, very easily to get out of that. So retain the full MLE, here's the challenge. You have to be below the first apron because you get hard capped at the first apron if you use that. So that's where it's going to get a little tight uh, for the Kings to open that up. They probably have to do another move uh, where they get off a little bit of salary um, to open that up because as it stands, after resigning Malik Monk, they'll probably be about $6.3 million or so under that first apron. Full MLE is about $12.9 million. Mm -hmm. So if you can get off a little bit more salary, you could get under – under, uh, you know, enough to use that full MLE. Um, and then, you know, you put yourself into the tax, but you're under the first apron. So doable, not impossible. We'll, we'll see how that comes together. Hey, Keith, uh, help me out on this. Can they uh, structure it in, in terms of weight on the Malik Monk signing uh, and, and use the MLE and then re-sign Malik? How, can they do something like that? Yeah, unfortunately you can't. So what happens is, once you use the, the non-tax MLE um, and you give a contract that can only be given out, uh, a contract that's greater than what can be given using the tax MLE, so either more money or more years, you now hard cap yourself at that first apron. So what that would mean is they could, they could use the MLE first, but then they'd have to lessen what they can give Malik Monk wow. again, unless they get off some other money if they do that. But well, once you're hard capped or – or once you're over that, you're, you're going to lock yourself into that hard cap number. NBA capologist Keith Smith is with us from Spot Track. There's been a lot of speculation here about Zach Levine coming here. We don't know much except apparently the two sides have talked, so it's a possibility. So, Keith, what kind of havoc would Zach Levine's deal, or I shouldn't say havoc, maybe maybe it's workable, uh, what kind of impact would his deal have on the King's salary structure? Yeah, if you made a trade for Zach Levine, so now this is where in this new CBA, it used to be very few things would, would subject you to a hard cap. Now in the new CBA, if you do a kind of a lot of different things, you end up hard capped at either the first or the second apron. So in the Kings case, they're not going to be able to make a trade for Zach Levine straight up. They, they don't have the salary structure to be able to do that. So what they would have to do is aggregate a couple guys or combine a couple of salaries together. I'm just going to use the ones that have been kind of thrown around in reporting. So like Harrison Barnes and Kevin Herter, and then maybe somebody else gets thrown in the mix there. And that's how you get a guy like Zach Levine. What that would do is that would actually hard cap the Kings at the second apron. So again, you're putting a little bit of a restrictor on yourself. Now you've got enough room. You should be able to do that and resign Malik Monk. But now you're talking about, you're probably doing a two for one at least, or maybe a three for one kind of trade. And, and you're going to have to fill out the roster. What that would mean is you're kind of a little top heavy in money. You'd have uh, Levine and, and um, Fox and Sabonis. And then, then you'd have Monk kind of a mid range contract. And then you'd have a lot of guys on the lesser contracts and you're mm. probably filling out with veteran minimum. Mm. Keith, how much uh, of this has to do with, what the owner is willing to spend. And I've asked you this because, you know, we watched the parade earlier today. I'm looking at all the money Wick Grosbeck and the Boston Celtics are throwing out, and we don't touch them in terms of cap space and, 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 and salary. How are they able to do that? Or is it just an ownership preference thing? Like, you know what? I'm go going all in. Second apron, it doesn't matter. I'm spending the money. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Now, what the Celtics did was, 
they, so when the new CBA came in, the NBA, as they've done in years past, they kind of gave everyone well, what I call it, it's a gap year, or a, I like to call it a get your books in order year. But what the Celtics did and the Suns did and the Bucks did, they said, well, this is the last year we could really load up and completely load up money on our cap sheet. So that's what they did. Boston went out, they made the Porzingis trade, they then made the holiday trade, and they took a bunch of money on uh, this year. So that's the difference. They weren't subject to any kind of hard caps because those rules now flow in this year. That's uh, one of the new changes that is coming in this year. So in the Kings case, they wouldn't even be able to get to that level. But there is a level of you know, just general spending. So like I said, Malik Monk, uh, re-signing him as it stands today without any further moves, the Kings are a little bit into the tax. That's ultimately an ownership decision. If they're willing to go into the tax that way, that's fine. You know, no, no issue with that. And then down the line, if you re-sign another guy and then re-sign another guy, now all of a sudden that's how you end up with these teams that are 20, 30 million deep into the tax and have those big tax bills. Well, what they cut off in the new CBA was the ability for, I'll call it a new tax team, to go and create a super team out of nowhere mm. like that. They put all these kind of hampers on these teams and restricted the ability to do that pretty greatly. And Keith, what would the tax actually be on the Kings if they decided, yeah, we'll go into the tax, what are they paying per dollar? Uh, very minimal. Right now, they're so low, it's about a dollar for dollar. Okay. Um, because they're only about a million into it. And then once you fill out the roster, you'd probably be about six, seven million in. Generally, anytime you're within five to 10 million over the tax, I look at that as that's a salary dump or two away from yeah. getting out of the tax right. entirely. Right. Here's the really important thing with that you don't need to be out of the tax day one of the off season, day one of the regular season. You're really only going to be out of the tax by the trade deadline. That's your real last chance to get off of money. And at that point, if you get out of the tax, they figure the tax off your end of year salary. So if you're a little into the tax at the beginning of the year, no big deal. You get out of it later. Keith, uh, do the Kings have limited flexibility, limited uh, uh, in terms of things they could do cap wise? Uh, we, you mentioned the MLE and, and with Malik signing, you know, you only get a partial bit of that. Are we kind of limited? I'm, I'm looking at Zach Levine and big name guys. Should we focus on, you know, uh, smaller contracts out there? It, it kind of depends. I mean, they have the ability to go make a big trade like that. At their challenges, then you're, like I said, you're probably talking a two or three for one kind of deal. And then you're filling out the rest of the roster with, with minimums. And we saw with Phoenix, that did not go well for them uh, this year. They, they were very top heavy and then had a whole lot of guys on the minimum. And when you start playing veteran minimum roulette, you might hit on one or two, but you're not going to hit on all of them. And that's, that becomes a little bit of your problem. So if you're the king, if you're looking at it more and saying, hey, we, we're kind of running it back right now with the guys we have. We like this group. Maybe you make a smaller deal or two and, and try to get guys in that way, then you're not necessarily bumping up against the hard cast that would be created or anything like that, then maybe you can even get in a position where, all right, we've made a smaller deal. Now we can use some of the MLE, and that's how we flush out our roster a little bit around our draft thing, too. We're talking with Keith Smith. He's an NBA capologist with uh, Spot Track. Uh, the new CBA, Keith, and I know this is a very ignorant question, but does it make a contract like Keegan Murray's even more valuable since he's a player the Kings drafted in the first place? Yeah, it can, and especially as you get into where the Kings are, they're probably headed in the next couple of years as being a more expensive team. It makes it very vital that you hit on those draft picks. For example, we talked about Boston before. If Boston, they've got a couple older players, and they want to try to uh, replenish the Ross from behind those guys, if they still remain very expensive, which they're highly likely to do, because they're going to extend Jason Tatum, they're probably going to extend Derek White, you're going to be really expensive. You have to nail your draft picks. That can be hard. Obviously, they're picking 30th this year. And if you're picking 20 and below, that can be tricky. But if you keep nailing those draft picks, you keep bringing in that cost-controlled lower salary, and that puts you in a much better place. Uh, talking to Keith Smith here on the drive, guys. Keith, uh, De'Aaron Fox, uh, what is he ex extension eligible? Yeah, he'll be extension eligible this summer. Now, for him, his spot's a little, little uh, – complicated because he's not necessarily in a place where he may he may want to delay extending um, because De'Aaron Fox has two years left on his deal. He has this upcoming year and one more year. He could add four more years onto his contract 
right now. But what he may want to do is wait one more year. Then he can add five more years potentially. And if he makes all NBA again, you're pushing him into a five year uh, super max. So he may be somebody who says, you know, let me delay on doing this extension right now. Let me wait rather than adding four years. Let me wait till I can add five. And maybe I can add five at that 35% of the cap number. And then that way I'm kind of, you know, really cashing in where, you know, for, I like to say like compare him to like Jamal Murray, Jamal Murray hasn't necessarily played at that level. He's never even been an all-star, never mind all NBA. He might be better off taking whatever's offered to him right now, locking that money in. Where De'Aaron Fox has been at that level, I could see him saying, you know what, let me put on myself getting back up to that level, and I'll be able to cash in even bigger a year from now. Keith, I have a two-parter regarding the Sixers for you, if I may. <laughs> okay. We know the Sixers... Um, what they're doing here, they don't have many players under contract because they're going big game hunting, supposedly. A, how unusual is that? I don't recall seeing teams doing that before. More to the point here, B, given how few players they have under contract, wouldn't that make it difficult for them to swing a trade for Zach Levine? Uh, yes and no to that second part. So um, so I'll, I'll answer both parts. So for a cap nerd like me, this is amazing. Like I, they, they've got two guys really kind of on their book yeah. that matter. It's Joel yeah. Bede and Tyrese Maxey. Now the difference is when other teams have been even close to a situation, it's like two guys who are maybe on their rookie contract and the team stinks. This is a team that has eyes on, hey, we get this right. We're title contenders. So this is a whole new thing that we've never seen before. So they could have, you know, very easily well over $60 million in cap space, which is go sign a player to a max deal and still have some spending power left over on the backside of that. So that makes it a very unique situation. Now for a guy like Zach Levine, it makes it hard because the Sixers aren't going to be able to necessarily send players back to, to the Bulls in a trade like that. But if they wanted to trade for him, what they can offer the Bulls is, Hey, rather than taking back a player or two whose contract maybe you don't really like, if you want completely out of Zach Levine's contract, wait $43 million plus off your salary sheet this right now, we can do that because they can just absorb him wow. in the cap space. Ooh, now, that means that's they're a big have trade exception, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be a massive trade exception wow. for the Bulls for sure. Now, they'd have to supplement that trade with draft picks, yeah. and that also gets a little tricky for Philadelphia because they are out some draft picks. But that that could be a doable thing if Chicago looks at it more of hey let's just get off some money let, let, let's go that direction. Wow man that's that's interesting that's Woo! that's good stuff right there our guy Keith Smith joining us here Sacktail Sports the Drive guys uh, Keith when you look at uh, you know some of the other uh, l- lesser uh, big name guys like a Kuzma like a John Collins those kind of are those guys contracts uh, easy to move at this point you think. Yeah, pretty easy. We're really, because of where we're at now in the NBA, it used to be if you were over $25 million, that was considered to be a really big contract. Now the really big contracts are like $40 million plus, right. just where contract growth. Those two guys are, are in the mid-20s. Those are very easy numbers to move. You can almost get there in a one-for-one type of swap mm-hmm. with the salary matching. Keith Smith, uh, check him out on Twitter. Uh, covering the NBA, a capologist for Spot Track. Keith, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. You know, we still haven't quite uh, digested everything you've told us, <laughs> but we learn a lot. Thank you, and we hope you have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. All right, me. Keith. Very All right, welcome. Man. Yeah, that's some heavy stuff. And the thing is, he rattles it off. Let, 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 let me just say, I, I don't know how you've co- come out of this. I'm not feeling good. About Zach Levine, my boy Zach Levine. I, I'm off the Zach Levine bandwagon. I'm off. Wait, 